definitely could be um, looked at as semantics as far as both of them are behavior. Okay. Can you give me a can you give oh, me yeah. a different technical problem just to absolutely. clean that up for me? Absolutely, absolutely. So um my media my media person comes to me and says, you know, um we could, you know, I'm I'm getting uh getting folks are saying that, you know, worship has become dry, you know, it's become dry. And I can I can I can really do some things with if you we bought a we bought a um um a projector and we got some software to to uh project up on this up on the the screen so uh, you can see the songs and so they can see the song along. exactly gotcha. there gotcha. you okay yeah yeah and that that would clearly be a technical problem That's something it. that you can exactly. okay i got you i'm good on that exactly. thank you so so there's the change though the change is the shift now we've now moved from you know just doing our regular you know sing singing worship we've gone now to more of a technical a, a, t a high tech kind of worship experience where people are able to follow along with the songs so so and, let me ask you would it would then within the adaptive challenge in that potentially be the praise leader saying now people will be looking up at the screen Instead of looking at me, maybe I lost the status. So, you know, is that the adaptive part in it or is it just not applicable? So, so you don't necessarily, sometimes you can, what I'm saying is the, the ability to discern between the two. Mm -hmm. Adaptive leader needs to be able to understand that, okay, sometimes they're not one in the same. They are absolutely gotcha. two different situations, right? And gotcha. to be able to discern the difference between the two is what's going to be important for you. Okay. So if I try to approach, if I try to approach the adaptive situation, you know, as the only problem, or and it may be, or if I try to approach it as uh, approach it approach it as a technical problem, and it, it can gotcha. totally avoid, you know, any other possibilities that I'm really kind of limiting myself. This is, this is really about creating diagnostics, gotcha. uh, giving you diagnostics. And, and I hope by the end of this presentation, I'm going to literally have you have some skill sets or at least a framework by which to think about your diagnostics and how you measure, how you look at different things. Because um, the biggest mistakes I think that leaders make is often avoiding the fact that there are some adaptive situations that are not, you know, that are absolutely being ignored and try to utilize only technical solutions to solve problems. You hear what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, that's one of the biggest issues. So once you become sensitized to the reality that, that, you know, adaptive solutions are, um, are more embedded, um, require more thought, more prayer, more, um, more risk taking, more provides you with some level also of, you know, having some comfort with experimentation. Um, then it kind of changes and starts uh, helping to, to you to reframe how to deal with problems. And more importantly, how do you create change within your your environment. And, and Doc, just to make a point, just to emphasize a point, yes. that yes. just like in medicine, if you fail to, to make the correct diagnosis, then the treatment plan would be in problems. Yes. And, and I think that is, that's very critical for us as leaders to make sure that we fully understand the issues at hand before we attempt to make Absolutely. any change. Right. A a absolutely. Diagnostics, man, it's so important. And, and that's what different, differentiates the, 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 uh, the adaptive leadership style, you know, I mean, there is a great deal of diagnostics. There is, we become somewhat anthropologist in, right. our, in our own ways, right? Because we are actually looking at the differences in which people bring and bring things to our organizations, as well as how they understand and make their own diagnostics and how this all works together, mm -hmm. you know, to accomplish the larger goal. Okay. So, um, Let's talk a little bit about this. This is big. This is huge. Um, distinguishing the difference between leadership 
and authority. Adaptive leaders, um, we realize there, there's, there's the recognition, forgive me, that uh, authority, power, and influence um, are often associated with leadership. And um, that is a misguided thought. Authority, power, and influence. It is misguided, and I'm going to show you why today. Every leader, every pastor, every president, every professor, every person that assumes some level of leadership it is all gauged on a social contract that is both informal and formal. It's a social contract. People agree that you can accomplish what is intended for those law, whatever that larger purpose is. And they agree through a social contract, be it informal or formal, to give you that place called leader. Now, I'm going to give you a perfect example. As the senior pastor of my first charge, I did not become the, I became the pastor in title, but not the pastor in authority. And I did not understand that. I heard it said before, you know, you don't become the pastor of the church until your first 10 years or whatever that number is. And I didn't understand that. But people bequeath authority and power and influence on the person. That is a social contract. And it is one based upon one's, their thinking about you as an individual and your abilities to accomplish whatever the larger goal is. These are social contracts. So authority is granted by one or more people on the assumption that when, you, when, when they will give you that, um, ideally, within the organization that you're going to be able to solve problems. It's, it's, a, it's a basic, the basic uh, fundamental understanding of, of bequeathing people with authority or power is that they entrust that to you for service. It is entrusted to you for service, period. So for the adaptive leader to understand leadership, you should understand leadership as a verb and not a job. It is not a job title. The scope of authority that derives from your uh, authorizers, and there's a scope of authority. You don't have all authority. You have a scope of authority that derives from people who authorize you, they authorize based on their expectations that has been defined. And they also define the limits based on what they expect. Everybody get that? Any questions before I go on? Um, Dr. Rodney, <clears throat> while while this is true that um, there is the general expectation that the leader is going to solve the problem, mm -hmm. um, very often in the reality of what we face in many countries with corruption, etc., mm -hmm. it's that people are chosen to 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 be there so that they could maintain the status quo or they can have privileges that others can't have mm -hmm. and uh, they can, you know, things like that. So, yes, yes, so. yes, yes you're, you're absolutely right. So 
so that whole status quo. Now we're talking about, let's keep keeping it, things in context. This is about understanding from an adaptive leadership perspective, understanding power dynamics and relationship dynamics. And part of being an adaptive leader is the resistance to really sit with the status quo, status quo. And so you're absolutely right. Probably one of the biggest things that we find with these social contracts that happen within countries where uh, they permit and they know that their leaders are self-serving. And part of the problem is that they get caught, they get caught in the status quo and feel powerless in terms of change. Well, there that's not the adaptive leader. The adaptive leader sees things very differently. And so what we're sharing with you is a paradigm on understanding what, how different leadership patterns form, how relationships form based on influence and power, but leadership doesn't necessarily always, always have a connection to authority and power. And that's what I want to kind of deconstruct a bit before I move into these next, next areas. And that is, a de that is a deconstruction, you know, of thinking. Yes. It's uh, yes, I'm, I'm trying to square what I'm hearing from you okay. with uh, some of the reading that I've done. Sure. And I thought that adaptive power, uh, adaptive leadership rather, uh, is mm -hmm. really about empowering the people who are closest to the problem mm -hmm. uh, with the ability to uh, exercise authority, make decisions, but yet at the same time still hold them accountable uh, for the results. Okay, so uh, misunderstanding. So, so no, I think you're jumping ahead. I think you're jumping ahead of me. Okay, but, I'm but, sorry. No, that's okay. That's okay because you you you're leading. You're giving me perfect segues, believe it or not, uh, into what you're going to be receiving here today. Okay. Thank you. So, so, I mean, perfect segues. But here's the, here's the thing I want you to know. I just deconstructed something that needed to be de de deconstructed. Or thinking, of, or thinking about leadership, authority, power, and influence, okay? It isn't always necessarily connected, immediately connected with what leadership is. And so if you deconstruct it first, before we go into this conversation, at least it opens up our minds to the, uh, a wider understanding of what leadership can and cannot do. It is authorized. We, f we flipped it to be something else. We flipped leadership to become powerful, influencer, and reality it is the people, the social contract that dictates the influence, the authority, the power, because no matter how well you are, um, how well you are educated, no matter how well you are charismatically endowed, people determine, they make a conscious decision and sometimes unconscious to form a relationship with that person. And when we give him the title, or we said to ourselves that he, this person has the ability to lead us, what they're really saying to you is that this person has the ability to solve our problems. Okay? Um, but if that's I can make it, it up on you. Yes. I if I can make an interjection there. Um, I mm -hmm. agree with that. Um, there's one point I may see slightly different, and you can probably please. Fight, fight, or, I invite you. Know. I invite um, you. And that again, I'm I'm letting you know the the, the background of this part of my hair. This okay. is after reading um, John Maxwell's um, writings and his books. Um, indeed, me, I agree I, that. Can I say something? I'm not sure a fan. Was. I'm not a fan of Maxwell or Drucker. Um, I'm glad I, to hear that. <laughs> I think they both are. They're 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 good marketers of something that research. They take good research and they use it to market it well. But I'm not um, in in my research in my work. They don't necessarily come across uh, authentically. So go ahead. 
Right, but I'm happy you said that because that's why I keep quoting my source so that I can hear your perspective because I'm sure you might be familiar with their work. Okay. Um, right, um, but the, um, as you mentioned, the authority or position mean, um, is not necessarily, does not necessarily equate with leadership. I agree with that because um, leadership is deeper than just position. Mm-hmm. Position is by, by default that you're a leader. However, I do, the part where I disagree slightly is that I think that with position, it's an entry level leadership that needs to be, or it's a playground, uh, if I, sh- I shall use that word, where you can develop further. Uh, because being in a position, you are now held accountable to demonstrate leadership, to lead, and this is specifically for organizations. I mean, in other um, entities, position may not be necessary to be a leader because in a home, they are leaders without, you know, having a position or so forth. But in an organizational context, I think with position, you're now expected to, you're now um, given the role to lead an organization. And as such, you, by definition, you have to lead. However, it's an entry-level leadership and you have to now develop relationships. You have to invest in people. You have to prove yourself in terms of your track record because people would lead People follow based on your track record, based on your productivity, based on your trust in you. As an entry-level leader, that is not defined as yet. There's no trust earned. It's just by default you're a leader. So my disagreement or my, my slight um, uh, take on it would be, yes, the position um, may be uh, in a, associated with leadership, but just as an entry-level. However, it's deeper than just a positional leadership. Yes. Okay. Now, I want you to put, I want, it makes perfect sense to me. What I'd like for you to do is this. At, at the end of this presentation, if you still hold that, if you still hold that position, let me know. I'd like, I'd love to talk to you about it further. Okay. Okay. Yes. So, so you gotta, you gotta let me get a little deeper. Not, I, I love the pushback. I love the idea that we are thinking through this process. This is what this is meant to be. Adaptive leadership is about thinking and reframing and questioning. And that is what is important. Not just, you know, hearing what someone has to say, but literally doing critical reflection. That's, that's what adaptive uh, leadership is all about. And so, so yes, uh, give me this opportunity to get through our presentation today and then see where I'm going with this. All right. All right. Great. Appreciate Just what, it. You, what you're saying has merit, but you haven't heard me out yet. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, all right. Great. Great. All right. Any any other comments, thoughts? Can we move on? So we're understanding leadership as a verb. You know, not as a job description, but as a verb. Is someone's? Yes, please. It's me, Gita. Is, I think um, Dr. Rodney that Gitahun is trying to get through. Maybe he can be advised to write his I comments in the chat you. box that you can look at. Okay. Yeah. Um, who who is it again that's trying to get through? Miss, his name is Gitahun. He's from Ethiopia. That okay. student. Uh-huh. Gita, all right. Gitahun. I. I'm having problems hearing you. If you hear me, um, I'm having problems hearing you. If you don't mind, just uh, put it into the chat box. I'll follow the chat box closely uh, with your comments because uh, your uh, your connection isn't isn't good. We're having problems hearing you. I think he dropped off the uh, the Zoom room. Maybe he'll jump back in here in a minute. Okay. All right. Great. Great. So. One of the most seductive ways your organization rewards you for doing exactly what it wants to provide operational excellence in executing directions set by others is to call you a leader. (laughs) Conferring leaders on you is a brilliant way 
of keeping you right where the organization wants you, in the middle of your scope of authority and far away from taking on adaptive leadership work. What do you think about that comment? The moment I call you leader is the moment I confer upon you a scope of authority. Dr. Rogers, I think this is our call. I think that's a tactic uh, or basically a tactic that is widely used by the church. And mm. sometimes I just heard, you know, previously when I was doing youth ministries in college, mm -hmm. I would hear young uh, believers say, why can't I just come to church and love the Lord without somebody trying to make me a minister, a deacon or a preacher? Mm. So I think it's a tactic that sometimes the church uses, may even overuse, but you're correct when someone bestows that or casts that on you and then says, see, you're a leader now, now you're expected to follow things this way. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's the truth. The moment you call leader is the moment that you've been given a scope of authority, expectations that the group say is acceptable. And you're not in any way encouraged to act outside of that scope. You become a rubber stamp then? Yes. It does. Right. That's playing, playing by the rules, eh? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I think, I think this coincides with what Vida was saying um, just a while ago. Um, in some cases, you are given that position, you're called, uh, appointed that position, especially in cultures where corruption <laughs> might be the name of the day, so that you can carry out the mandate or the mindset of whoever is the leader. I do, however, believe that um, uh, th there might be a, a, a plus side to it, <laughs> um, as with everything. I guess um, that's my optimi optimistic side coming out there. There may be a plus side. I mean, yes, um, the a leader or the general manager of a company would want to have persons who would be able to carry out his vision, want to put them in place to ensure that that is done. Because, you know, I think someone earlier said that if you imagine a coach, you're going to take the persons who, who, are, who are in tandem with your vision. If you have persons who are working against you, then you'll just self-disrupt. Right? Um, but at the same time, um, being called a leader, gives you the opportunity maybe to have some influence on um, the general staff leader that may be much needed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. So you're carrying out, ultimately, you're carrying out the goals and expectations of that organization, of that group of people who have designated you leader, that you're capable of doing that. You're capable of solving their problems and carrying out the mission, the, 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 the overall direction mm -hmm. Of the, of the organization. In some ways, you're paying a very functional part, but that you're being conferred upon something that you at least need to understand that, again, people are authorizing, once they call you leader, they're authorizing you for a particular set of, of reasons. And it's important to understand that. So adaptive leadership, is not about meeting or exceeding your, your authorizer's expectations. It is about challenging some of those expectations, finding a way to disappoint people without pushing them completely over the edge. <laughs> what do you think about that? Adaptive leadership isn't for everybody. It is not for everyone. And so it is, in, from my perspective, a very specialized area because there is a certain level of risk that you have determined as a part of your personality, your, your, your mental and cognitive makeup that you can tolerate for the sake of a wider good. So adaptive leadership, I'll state again, is not about meeting or exceeding your authorizer's expectations. It is about challenging some of those expectations, finding a way to disappoint people without pushing them completely over the edge. Afterwards, managing the resistance you inevitably created, okay? You created the resistance. Now it's time to manage it. And that's what adaptive leaders do. 
be prepared to push, be prepared for the pushback. Being prepared for the pushback. This, this is uh, this is kind of one of those nuanced areas of transformational leadership. Not always about them making people feel good. It's actually about pushing them, pushing triggers, finding places to push and then watch, sit back and watch, do some diagnostics. See where the change, where you actually find change needs to happen. But also recognizing that when you're pushing you know, these different levers, that it's going to have some response, some reaction. So the adaptive leader isn't so much a person that's interested in being liked, nor being hated. And I would think that um, we all have a certain respect for John the Baptist in the Bible, right? <laughs> he has this um, way about him. But um, I want to stop. Any questions before we go on? I'm kind of building, I'm deconstructing to build a case here. About, um, about adaptive leadership, yes. Just wanted to make one comment there quickly. Um, I think, I, I mean, I see where you're going. I see, that, sure. and I must say this, this statement is a very strong statement, um, especially the word disappoint. I mean, um, I would, and this is just a preference of mine, it doesn't mean that I'm not in agreement. I would yeah, yeah, prefer, okay. um, right? Because I'm, I'm thinking right away, with all that you've said, it comes back to the book, I think my favorite, most favorite book so far, Riding the Waves of Culture. Mm -hmm. And um, it deals so much with people's attitude and interpretation of culture. So for example, dealing with managing something that, managing a present oriented culture. When you're bringing about change, persons do not want the change unless, unless it, it focuses heavily on the present and not so much on something that is different from what they're accustomed to. Mm -hmm. So um, that in itself is a disappointment to others because they want, they want things that are in tandem with their culture. However, what the book encourages us to do is to be adaptive in ourselves as a leader to um, not change our foundation, but to be more accommodating of their attitude. Um, so that was the, the, the slant I was getting initially, that yeah. it's about being more accommodating. Um, but this point here is a, on a, on a different, has a different tone now, not yeah. necessarily being more accommodating, but actually standing firm, even though it might disappoint um, the authorizers. Yeah, so uh, we, we understand that uh, as a, in adaptive leadership, we understand that there are different cultural things that are happening, values that are, that are there, that exist when you are in a leadership position. We understand that, and there's a sense of tolerance, but there is a greater, there's a greater purpose. There is a, a larger picture. There's, um, there's a, a, a place where you are aiming to achieve or the organization itself it says we have to get to this place we understand our history we understand you know where we are now but it's going to take this set of set of strategies or this set of uh, way of thinking to get us to the place where we ultimately want to be and so it's about change and and understanding external and internal external as well as internal factors that require you to make necessary changes and so the adaptive leader is really not just gauging internally, but is also uh, recognizing that there are external threats out there as well. That's kind of creating the need for change. That's driving the need for change. So we're not just doing change for change's sake. We're thinking change for the betterment of the people that have been, who have authorized you to lead, okay? was authorized you to lead. And it's the very people who have authorized you to lead. And this is what I want you to clearly understand. The very people that have authorized you to lead are the very people who will be resisted to working out what they perceive, working with you outside of what they perceive your scope of authority is. Do you understand what I just said? 
I get the general they just they, they frame right the the authorizers frame what your scope of responsibilities are and so when they've scoped that but they you know but you're the change that is required is for you to somewhat dance outside of that scope of authorization for the sake of adapting the organization or moving the organization to the next place and there is there is where the disappointment comes in you know because you're going to disappoint people when in fact you do something that what they feel is outside of the scope of your authority that's, that brings disappointment that brings anger that brings a sense of loss it brings all of those different things that are sometimes uh, unspoken. All right, I hear you. Okay. Great. So, in a word, adaptive leadership is dangerous. So I don't know what books you've been reading, <laughs> but um, it's dangerous. It's dangerous work, and it's not for the, the faint at heart. It goes against the expectations of the very people who gave, give you formal and informal authority. It's dangerous. Adaptive leadership is an iterative process involving three key activities. Observing events and patterns around you. Patterns of behavior. Interpreting what you are observing, not just ob observing, but, it, but making interpretations, developing multiple hypotheses about what is really going on. Number three, designing interventions based on the observations and interpretations to address the adaptive challenge you have identified. I got a little graph to go along with it. I'll uh, send this with the notes. Any thoughts about this? Adaptive leadership is an iterative process. It's an ongoing process, constantly diagnosing, constantly making observations. So it's not for, you know, it's not for the faint at heart, neither is it for people who are just kind of, you know, laissez-faire. It's for thinking people, people who enjoy the challenge of thinking about movement, change, when it is required. Any questions, thoughts before we move into this next segment? This is Bill. Let me just make one kind of plug on dissertation work. I think mm -hmm. just as you look at the, these three issues, observing events, interpreting what you're observing, and designing an intervention, you're basically mm -hmm. design. You're actually, you know, describing the BGU uh, dissertation process. So I would just tell everybody, you know, take note of that <laughs> because that's 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 kind of a it in a nutshell. Yes, yes, it is. Thank you, Bill. All right. So here's a here's a uh, graph the three different headers, task, technical, adaptive. There's four different areas going along the left side of the screen. Direction, protection, order, which has three different categories under it, orientation, conflict, norms. And the last area is disequilibrium. Disequilibrium. Now, this is actually something that you could use as part of your thinking as an adaptive leader. When we come across technical problems, all four of these areas, direction, protection, order, orientation, conflict, norms, disequilibrium, they all are part of both technical as well as adaptive solutions. So on the technical side, we provide problem, we provide problem definition and solution. 
based on a technical need that is uh, need to be uh, addressed or a technical problem that needs to be uh, addressed. We protect from external threats, whatever external th threats are. We protect. We are making decisions based on, you know, how to protect ourselves from external threats. Order is something that is of a technical nature. Orient people to their current roles. When we bring folks in, we orient orientate them to certain things that they are required to do. We restore. We are about restoring order on the technical side. We maintain the norms on the technical side. Um, and then. Uh, managing yourself in that environment as well is important. So we met, we self-manage. We also manage to keep things in order the way they are with the technical realities. Now, when we move over to the adaptive side of it, it's a different story. The direction is identifying the adaptive challenge. What are the, what is the real challenge? Frame the key questions and issues. What are the key questions and issues that are being dealt with? Okay, we think about this. We 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 um, we process this information in such a way that we're coming up. We're, we're asking hard questions of what's really going on, not just using technical. You know, saying okay, this is with with certainty. This is the problem. This is how we address it, and we keep everything in order. Keep every keep the status quo exactly the way it is supposed to be because this is obviously just one of those kind of uh, flaws that you know that happens one kind of a hiccup that happens we can just address this well no the adaptive leader says you know something let's let's look at this reframe some the question let's think about the real issues underneath this let's think about culture and some of the things that you know some of the ways culture and behavior is playing out in this whole process Protection, disclose, we disclose what the external threats are. We disclose what they are. We, we come to understand and we disclose, we tell people, we tell the group, these are, these are what the external threats are, okay? We don't keep it to ourselves. We literally expose them. We don't want to frighten people or the organization, but it's clear that the ideal is to get them on board with understanding the broader picture. Disorient current roles, resist orienting people to new roles too quickly. So oftentimes people get stuck doing the same thing over and over again, and they get, you know, they, they get reluctant to change because of that familiarity, which you all talked about. People get familiar with certain ways of doing things, and they, you know, they want to stick with the status quo, this is what I've been used to doing for the past 10 years. It's been acceptable to the organization. Well, the adaptive leader says to himself, I need to get more out of this, this individual for the organization, for the larger purpose sake. What do I need to do? What do we need to do to, to kind of reconstruct or reframe for that person? And then when I bring somebody into a new role within the organization, I'm not so quick to associate the old way of doing things with this person, uh, uh, permitting them and, and you to kind of even reconstruct the way that the position, you know, better fits uh, the needs of the organization current, as well as their skill sets, their skill sets and their giftings. Okay. So, so doing observations before we just throw people into a position, give them a job title and say, go at it. You know, this is yours but doing more assessments. We don't necessarily look to restore order. We expose conflict and let it emerge. Adaptive leaders are not afraid of conflict. They're not afraid of it. They don't avoid it. In fact, it becomes a bit of an attraction because you never know what's going to come out of it that could be useful. Remember, the adaptive leader has an ex experimental mindset. Let's explore this situation. We challenge uh, the adaptive leader challenges norms or let them be challenged. So when the adaptive leader is not afraid to hear a counter argument or a different way of seeing things or 
uh, permitting someone the opportunity, the flexibility to do something differently for the sake of the larger purposes. So the adaptive leader recognizes that there are things, new things that can be generated in a process when things are a bit disoriented or it's not as we're used to. And the, dis uh, the disequilibrium, it assists people uh, to tolerate the discomfort. The, the, uh, the adaptive leader has to help people tolerate discomfort because they're going to experience this discomfort. It's just going to happen. Any questions? Any questions, any thoughts? Um, in any part of this, uh, does the adaptive leader, um, well, I guess the fact, as you mentioned, they're not into restoring order, moreover, exposing conflict let it emerge, and I'm tying that in with um, assisting people to tolerate discomfort. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of finding a solution, how 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 does this tie in with um, providing a solution as opposed to restore, restoring order via a new solution? In other words, how do we compare restoring order via a new solution as opposed to exposing conflict, letting the conflict emerge? towards, you know, how, how does yes. that? And so, and so that's the, the, the language within the, the, and this is something that we, I don't have time to explore with you, but that's the, the absolute great question. The mindset is not just exploration of, of what can happen in terms of the conflict and possibly even the feeling of chaos, um, which is very uncomfortable in any environment. But the, the whole idea is, to approach everything, you know, from a solutions kind of perspective. You know, we're looking for solutions, but we also have some hypotheses that we've generated, okay, that we're testing, you know, and it's, you know, should we, should we just stay where we are? Should we just stay where we are, keep everything comfortable, keep everyone comfortable within an environment that, um, that is not producing the kind of outcome or is not shifting to the, you know, in a way that, um, that addresses some of the concerns going forward for the future of the organization. So, um, but, but ideally in the conversations on how you are talking about um, these potential uh, solutions, you, you, you're speaking you know, you have some hypotheses about how things are going to work. You know, you do have some assumptions that you're bringing into the process that are kind of guiding your process. And, and here's where this discernment comes in. Discerning whether or not, um, you know, it, it's a little too much for people to handle and how to kind of, kind of bring things together, you know, kind of, uh, create balance in such a way that people are able to still function, you know, is a, that's an, that's an adaptive process that you grow to understand that you grow to learn. And when you make mistakes, absolutely. But you're, you're coming in with some hypothesis that's kind of framing the ideal, you know, it's kind of framing where you're going. Okay. Don't necessarily so, mean that the hypotheses have to be right. Okay. And there has, and to my, from my perspective, there always, no matter, even in the most familiar situations, there's always, it's good to have a certain degree of uncertainty. Anybody that's too confident in the outcomes, I will back away from 100%. Because the uncertainty is the things that you've not, you, you're not able to gauge until you've, you know, been able to see certain behaviors come forward. For instance, what I'm saying to you is, 
that when you start stirring the pot, you start seeing some of these informal systems that are in, in place that you did not see before. Informal relationships, power dynamics begin to start playing out that you did not see before, you know. So things begin to happen that you did not, you could not even begin to think or imagine that it would happen. Things start happening based on different kinds of social contracts that are happening within that organization. So it's no way that you can guarantee any outcomes, but it's good to have hypotheses. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, and one final question quickly. Um, how do you see team as most time when you're being hired, they ask about um, team player, are you a team player? How do you see that term? Um, <laughs> is it a characteristic of the adaptive leader? Yeah. So, um, Again, I think, um, and now you're asking a very personal question because I, I have to often struggle with that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but the adaptive leader, leadership, um, given that it is a, you know, there is opportunities where you engage it as a discipline. That does not mean that you cannot be a part of a team and play your part in the team. But you engage it as a discipline when given the opportunity to engage and to engage it and to know when you are intentionally engaging in that process. Doesn't mean that you you, you know that you can't be a team player. So so those those two don't negate each other. But because of your because of a discipline of adaptive leadership, you've adapted a certain kind of way of engaging um, your leadership, um, and I think it's it's fair to people to at least understand that, you know, uh, in your in your it's part of your whatever ecosystem that you're in. This is Bill. Unfortunately, we're starting to get toward the end of our time limit with our session. Mm -hmm. So let's mm -hmm. maybe we just try to kind of uh, wrap things up and. Dr. Rogers, could you make us any, any concluding comments that you think would just be really critical for these, these folks yeah. to understand? Can I, can I jump to, because I had a, I had a, a few archetypes um, yeah. that, that I thought would be helpful, and also how to identify an adaptive organization. Go for it. That'd be a good summary. Yeah. yeah. Those will be, those are, so we're going to jump from um, PDZ for adaptive challenges that happens when you start dealing with it, adaptive. Uh, ad adaptive um, paradigms. These are four areas that you're going to, you should be able to recognize. Um, so challenges, gap, there's a gap between espoused values and behavior. Um, within an organization and there, if there's competing commitments, um, when there is the culture of, of, of speaking the unspeakable, if there is no culture for speaking the unspeakable, you know, that can be a, be a challenge. Radical ideals, naming difficult issues, painful interpretations of conflicting perspectives, you know, um, that suggests if an organization permits this kind of thing, it really says a lot about who they are. If there's work avoidance, the resistance to adaptive change and a variety of different things happen within the organization when, when there's work avoidance and there's reasons for that. Again, this is kind of four archetypes that uh, could be useful for you to give some idea of what kind of organization that you might be in or running or you're dealing with. Now, how do I identify an adaptive organization? An adaptive organization, they name the elephants in the room. Okay, they name the elephants in the room. They're not afraid of naming what those elephants are. Number two, the responsibility for the organization's future is shared. It's a shared process. Everybody understands it, we're moving towards it, and we'll do what is required to make sure that the organization's future is secure. Number three, their independent judgment is expected. It becomes a part of the culture that people exercise independent judgment that is relevant 
leadership number four, leadership capacity is developed. We're not just talking about bestowing people with titles, but there's also a process in place to develop their capacity for the sake of the larger purposes. Number five, reflection and continuous learning are institutionalized. So literally learning new ways to interpret what goes on around you and new ways to carry out work becomes the, the um, that's the culture. That's the work culture. It is, you know, learning the expectation that there's a continuous process that's going on. So um, I often ask the question, not just uh, at BGU, but also in my church, I ask myself as the, as the minister of this congregation, are we a learning organization? Not just a practicing, worshiping uh, congregation, but are we a learning organization? And so that is always before me. And so I always ask that question to every, um, every place that God permits me to be a part of. Are we a learning organization? Basically what I'm asking, what I'm looking for are those five areas. Are they being covered? Are they a part of the culture of that organization? With that, I have completed my presentation. Thanks so much, Dr. Mm -hmm. Rogers. Excellent material. And mm -hmm. I think I just put in the chat room, these would be excellent topical areas around which uh, students could develop some questions for their assessment project as they are you know, looking at their organizations. And I think these, mm -hmm. these arch type areas that you've just mentioned would be great as they're trying to discern what an organization, you know, how, how it's functioning. You know, is it functioning, uh, you know, in an adaptive form or is it uh, functioning in a more oppressive uh, kind of form that's not allowing uh, that, that kind of uh, growth to happen? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So good. Uh, I, as I was listening to the presentation, now there's a book on your, uh, it's on the, on the recommended list, it's not on the required, it's by Tupper uh, Kasue and, and Jean Deska, it's called Toolkit for Organizational Change. And there's some good categories in there, I think. I just, since we dealt, uh, Dr. Rogers dealt a lot with change today and, you know, kind of talking about the PEST model, P-E-S-T, some of the areas that you'd be looking for in an organization, the political issues, the economical issues, the sociological, the technological. There's several models like that that are described in there. You know, some of the different people that how they play various roles in, in the area of change. There are those people who are uh, change initiators, visionaries. There are those who are the change implementers, are the ones who are able to manage change and kind of, uh, you know, kind of grease the wheels so it goes a little more smoothly. And uh, so you, if, if you haven't ever looked at that book, you might want to take a look at that book, uh, Toolkit for Organizational Change. Just a lot of tools there and some other diagnostic kinds of tools that, it, that you could possibly use uh, when you're doing assessments. Mm -hmm. All right. I think uh, Dr. Rogers is going to send me those notes and then I will go ahead and distribute those to everyone. I'll put those in the in the course so you can get at those. There's just a lot of material there to digest, I think. And uh, that, that presentation has just really helped me uh, even kind of, uh, it, it helped me understand the book even a little better by Obaleski. So, you know, this is, you know, I've not done a lot of study in this area, but it's very helpful. So thanks a lot, Dr. Rogers. Oh, it's my privilege, my privilege. I appreciate the, um, the opportunity. We do. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, I think with that, we are going to have to go ahead and close up the session today. Uh, again, continue the uh, conversations in your, uh, in your chat rooms, in your discussion forums. And I just appreciate the fact that you're all uh, getting involved there. And uh, I have kind of, I'm, I'm limiting the weekly written assignments so that you can spend a, a little more quality time in really doing, uh, you know, high level discussion. Uh, it's really critical, especially in an online course like this. So, you know, there's really not going to be a written assignment this week or next week, I think, if I'll look at the next time I'll have you actually do a, we a weekly written assignment will be uh, putting together an outline for your assessment process so that uh, both Dr. Leach and I can give you some feedback uh, on those outlines before you do a final presentation of that outline for about five minutes in a concluding uh, re-room. 
We won't have any B rooms over the next uh, couple of weeks. We won't have another B room until uh, the, the ninth week when we will get together for our presentations. But again, I will, we will be interacting with you uh, online and uh, trying to give you some, some helpful pointers on the whole issue of uh, assessment. All right, I'm gonna have to close down the session. So we're kind of getting to the end and appreciate all of your time. And uh, so let's go ahead and go to what God is leading us to do today. Thanks for joining me. Bye now. Mm -hmm.